In this video, we're going to discuss the idea of quantum superpositions. Now, I want to motivate this concept with an example. So to build this example, I want to consider our free particle wave function. So the free particle wave function, we've seen this before. Um, it defines our free particle that is, you know, free to travel in any direction and is not under the influence of any potential. Right. So this is the wave function that describes such a particle. In the video on probability density, we saw that if we assume that the constants A and B are equal and we use Euler's relationship, um, instead of being defined by this uh, linear combination of functions, it collapses down to a single function, right? This 2A cosine KX, right? Uh, mathematically, what a superposition is, is just a sum of different functions. But in quantum mechanics, it has some physical meaning behind it as well. So what I want to do is take this collapsed version of our free particle wave function, when we assume that the constants are equal and we use Euler's relationship and simplify, I want to use this wave function and I want to apply the linear mo uh, momentum operator to it, right? We've, we've seen the linear momentum operator. If we have rho x, that's just going to be equal to h bar over i d dx, right? So you're taking the first derivative and multiplying by the constant out front. So let's actually apply the momentum operator to this wave function. So I want to apply the momentum operator. Right, so we're gonna apply the momentum operator to this wave function. So that means we're gonna have h bar over i d dx, and we're gonna wanna take the derivative of 2a cosine kx. Right, so this is our wave function. We wanna take the derivative of that, you know, to be consistent with the linear momentum operator. So if we do that, we know that the two and the a are constant, so we can actually pull that guy out front. And we got h bar over i d dx cosine kx, right? So, um, so we end up with this and we just have to take the derivative of cosine kx in order to solve this problem. So, um, so the derivative of cosine is just negative sine. So we end up with negative two, two K A H bar over I sine K X. Okay, so you may notice an issue here. Now that we've taken the derivative, we see that we get this final result. This sine K X is different from the cosine kx that we started with. So this wave function is not going to be a uh, eigenfunction of the linear momentum operator, right? Um, but for it to be a valid quantum mechanical representation, it has to be an eigenfunction, right? We talked about this. This is how you verify solutions to the Schrodinger's equation. This is how you verify wave functions is to see if they are eigenfunctions of valid quantum mechanical operators. And in this case, this wave function is not. So we run into an issue. And the issue is we don't have both representations of this superposition, right? We've assumed that these constants are both equal and we can collapse this wave function down into this, this superposition of functions down into this single function. And that is just not the case. You're not going to have an accurate representation of the free particle wave function. So that means that there's physical meaning behind each of these functions that we're missing when we collapse the wave function down to a single function, right? So let's, let's talk a little bit about that physical meaning. Right, so we looked at this when we first introduced the linear momentum operator, right? The, well, the, uh, the free particle wave function, right? We talked about this wave function and how each of these uh, each of these portions of the wave function gives a unique uh, momentum eigenvalue that corresponds to the particle moving in two different directions. So you can think of this first term as the particle moving with momentum to the right, 
right? Because this had a momentum of positive KH bar. Right, the momentum here was positive KH bar plus the other function is with the particle moving to the left, right? And this is, has a momentum of negative KH bar. Right, so the physical meaning of each of these functions is that one function defines the particle moving to the right with a particular momentum and the other function uh, represents the particle moving to the left with that same momentum. Now, in quantum mechanics, we can't specify whether a particle is moving to the left or to the right. We have to speak in very probabilistic terms, similar to the Born interpretation of the wave function. We have to speak statistically. So what we have to kind of work under is the framework of we're, we're measuring these quantum, uh, quantum mechanical properties over a long series of observations, right? So let's say if we measured a long series of observations of these free particles, there would be a few things we would note. So if uh, we measured a long series of observations Right, so a long series of observations will result in a few insights. Right, so the first thing is that the magnitude of the momentum of our free particle would always be kh bar. Right, so the magnitude would always be kh bar. Right, because regardless of which of these uh, superpositions we, or which of the functions in this superposition we look at, the momentum is kh bar. They only defer by a sign, right? One is positive kh bar, the other is negative kh bar. So they really only defer with this sign convention. So, uh, so the magnitude of that momentum is always going to be kh bar. Now, since we only have two possibilities and there's no potential that is biasing the particle to want to move left or want to move right, it should be a coin flip, right? Half of the uh, measurements will show the particle moving to the left, half would show the particle moving to the right, right? So 50% of observations would have particle moving to the left. So moving left and 50% would be it moving right. Right now, if, if there was some other consideration that we had to take into account, it might change that percentage, right? If there was some, you know, very attractive Coulombic potential that was on the left side of our problem, then the particle might be biased towards the left and you might see more of those observations coming with the particle moving to the left towards that attractive potential. But since there's nothing else biasing this problem, it's just a free particle, it's free to move to the left or the right um, in one direction, then we should it should just be a coin flip, right? 50% uh, to the left, 50% to the right. Right now, we can't predict the direction, um, only that there is just an equal probability of them moving uh, to either side. So we can only say that there's an equal probability of the particle moving left or right. Right. So, like I said, because of this, because we can't just say, you know, we can't just isolate the particle and say, ah, it's moving to the left and it'll always be moving to the left. We have to speak in terms of probabilities. So this brings us to a very important property that we'll have to evaluate for quantum mechanical systems. And it's something called the expectation value. The expectation value. And so basically for any operator, the expectation value is, you can think of it as the average, right? So, um, so rather than saying the particle is moving to the left, you would say that there's a 50% chance that the particle is moving to the left. And we denote the expectation value. So hypothetically, if we want to take the expectation value of the momentum operator, you use these uh, triangle brackets and then you just put the, 
operator inside those triangle brackets, this would be the expectation value of the momentum operator. So this will be the focus of the next video, right? So this is motivate, motivated by the fact that we can't really pin down um, the exact location or, mo or movement or direction of a particle. We can only talk about this in a very probabilistic way. So that motivates the need for calculating the average, calculating the expected value of a property rather than its actual value at a given time. And so that'll be the focus of the next video is introducing and, and defining expectation values.